Hi, um, this is Joe Maycook with the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society Cultivating Community Gardens Histories Project or the Community Garden Memory Project. Uh, today's date is October 25th, 2022, and I'm right here on Zoom recording an interview with Sharon Hildebrand, who is, I believe, still steering committee chair at Brewery Town Garden. Yes, that's true. Yes, so you've been involved with the garden um, since its inception, as far as that I can tell. But um, before we talk about the garden itself, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your background. So where did you grow up and did you or your neighbors have gardens there? Yeah, um, I grew up in Iowa. So I grew up in a very small town of about 900 people. And my parents had mostly my mom, but well, no, that's not true both my parents together had uh, flower gardens um, and you know main, maintained a very immaculate yard. Uh, we had a pretty big yard with lots of maple trees and pretty nice sweet space. Um, so they didn't grow vegetables until after I had left for college. I was the youngest of four. Um, and then they set up a little vegetable garden at that point. But um, exposure to gardening, um, in my early life was through my my paternal grandmother who um, had her entire side yard planted with vegetables and she um, you know put up vegetables every um, summer um, the basement was stocked full of green beans and tomatoes and pickles and anything you could imagine um, and I remember visiting her and, and there was always something coming out of the garden anytime um, we shared a meal with her um, so that's kind of my first memories of vegetable gardening. Um, and then um, my first job was in Iowa City, Iowa. And I purchased a home while I was there. And again, had a fairly nice sized yard and um, put a pretty big uh, kind of combination of vegetable and, and flower garden there. And lived there for about 10 years and gardened um, that entire time. So that's kind of the beginning roots of my gardening. So you kind of combined the um, difference, I mean, the different initial strengths of your parents' flower garden and your paternal grandmother's uh, vegetable garden on your right. own. I did. But, <laughs> yes. But so so um, you learned to garden from your parents and your grandmother then mostly? Yeah, I would say so. Um, when I... Um, purchased my home. Um, I was living there with two other people and um, we all kind of pitched in, but mostly um, I guess the concept was pretty much mine. Um, we all labored in the garden together, but and reaped the benefits together. Um, but I had kind of a, a, a pretty clear vision of what I wanted to do. I had a little um, herb garden off to the side too that um, was, was really nice. Um, yeah. And some of that may have come from doing some traveling and just um, visiting gardens and, and getting some inspiration and ideas from from that as well. Say say more about the traveling. Because um, visiting gardens is something that's always interesting to me as someone who I was I did my like thesis on garden history. Yeah, so um, pretty much any any time that I've traveled anywhere new, um, if there are gardens um, to see, um, I'll make sure to to take a day um, to to kind of go and and walk through gardens. And um, so, you know, part of that was probably a trip to um, to England. So very kind of formal gardens in some ways. Um, later, other European trips to you know France and. Um, the Netherlands um, got to see some beautiful gardens there too. So um, yeah, that all has kind of um, oh, been inspiration, I guess, for you know something to aspire to, although I don't think I ever really <laughs> um, see that through, but um, I admire those gardens nonetheless. Yeah, and I mean, that's a, so, so in addition to the influences of your parents and your extended family, you also are drawing on these influences when you're gardening on your own for the first time. 
of formal gardens in England. Um, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, but so I want to jump forward a little bit. I mean, and I will, I guess, let's jump forward a little bit in time when you move after you've moved, I assume, to another big gardening place, Philadelphia. Because um, so I understand your history with the Brewery Town Garden site actually goes back to before it was, uh, what is the day Brewery Town Garden, um, when it was a garden, which, well, the Marathon Grill directed Marathon Farm, right, um, in 2011, right. Mm -hmm. and that had a small community section. So how did you come to that site? Uh, so I bought a house in, in the neighborhood in Brewery Town in 2004, and um, nothing was really happening up there. And honestly, I don't remember kind of, it, it was just around the corner from me. I lived on Thompson. The, the um, garden is between Thompson and Master, so it was really just around the corner. Um, but I didn't spend too much time um, walking that direction. I mostly walked east, west, or south. Um, I had uh, some raised beds and some things in, on the patio um, behind my house. There was a large vacant lot right behind the house that had been a piano factory until I think it burned in the 1970s and um, had kind of aspirations to garden there, but um, without knowing um, the owner or um, you know anything about, I, I was a little bit afraid to invest in doing that. So I never did. Anyway, um, been there for a few years before um, walking the dog one day started to see the, the work that was being done um, on the lot on 27th and Master and um, just was kind of keeping an eye on things and um, one day talked with who became the, I think his title might have been manager, um, but he was a neighbor who, who lived there, Eddie Branch, and Eddie um, had been given permission to uh, basically build and fill plots um, to the south of what Marathon was using for their farm to table operation. Um, so just on the other side of the greenhouse from where they were and to rent those spaces to neighbors. And so um, I got in very early and invited a couple of friends who were also um, more in the Fairmount area, but um, close to the neighborhood too. And so we just had a heyday. Um, in those early days, there were maybe a dozen of us um, that were gardening there. We didn't really interact very much, you know, beyond saying hello as we would come and go and run into each other. Um, it was just kind of, we were all doing our own thing until we started to see that Marathon was losing interest. Um, in their operation. And that's when we started really kind of talking. Yeah, so that, so was that like, when would you say that was like around 2012 or 2013? Yeah, probably so. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's, that's right. Yeah, I saw, I saw an article about neighbors who were organizing about the, how it was being neglected in 2013. So that checks out. But so then you get this, so the plot, so at that point, what does the, I mean, I get, I mean, there's, there's already articles out there about what the plot kind of looked like at that point, like weedy, overgrown, under, mm -hmm. like, un, you know, underutilized. Um, so, man, I almost, they, there's a lot that like, you know, I guess, I don't know, but so then how does it, how does it come about? From your from your perspective, um, that you get into I I you get into contact with the people um, to you know turn it into a uh, long term community garden. It's st it started out as a little frustrating. We were trying to actually contact Marathon directly, and um, we weren't having real good success with that. Um, we were trying to kind of through um, contacts that people had <laughs> um, kind of reaching out to them through third party. I, I don't know why it was so difficult, but we just, we were having difficulty reaching them. Um, we finally um, 
talked with Donna Bullock and uh, at that time, she's our state representative now um, representing this district, but she was in Council President Clark's office at the time. And so, you know, we knew her as a neighbor and um, someone on city, working with city council. Um, and so we, we had a meeting with her and she brought, um, oh my gosh, I just, Sorry, my brain, I just lost her name from Parks and Rec, Elisa Ruiz Esposito, um, to the meeting uh, to talk about the possibility of um, going under the jurisdiction of Parks and Rec. And um, that meeting was interesting because um, I don't know that anyone other than us felt like we could run that big a space as a community garden. <laughs> Um, there was talk of um, basically leasing maybe part of the space to um, a farmer um, who wanted to start a, a pickle production. Um, so they would have been growing cucumbers on mostly, I think, on the other side where Marathon had been. And we really didn't want that. We wanted this to be a neighborhood um, gathering space and uh, we really felt like we could bring enough people to the garden to uh, to keep it in good shape and and um, yeah, really turn it into a community resource. So they we convinced them, and they they I think always knowing that um, they could bring in the pickle people as we called them <laughs> at any moment. We worked hard to at, at one point I think. Um, my partner and I had six plots that we were tending. So everybody just took on extra and, and then, you know, continued to try to invite um, neighbors and everyone we could uh, to come and join us. Wow. So it was kind of more of a touch, it, it was kind of a touch and go thing on Parks and Rec's part at the time. It was a little bit. I mean, they were just getting started also with the Farm Philly program. And so, yes. um, yeah, it was, we were at our beginning stages and they were at theirs. And so we were kind of learning and growing together. Um, and then we still had city council kind of not maybe convinced that um, we could pull this off. So, um, but we were, we set out to prove everybody, um, not to prove them wrong, but to, to prove ourselves right that we could do it we knew we could yeah I mean it is a big space it's kind of reminiscent I think in the array of different individual spaces you have Im among the garden um and in just the overall like kind of size of Bell Arbor Community Garden I think but I think it's probably I feel like it's bigger than Bell Arbor but I might be wrong um uh, yeah we're right around a half an acre I'm yeah sure. I think that's about the same size yeah but yeah like yeah um but uh but so you you get parks and recreations blessing um with the understanding that pickle people are a potential you know backup on their part um and you set out to prove yourselves right um i want to ask at this point because now obviously I mean, and you also have, I want to also say at this point that you have a very well developed website with like a long history of the garden. Um, and there's a lot of articles about the development of Brewery Town Garden. So I'm not as, so, you know, I don't feel the need to ask specific, to ask, you know, about everything that's happened. But I want to ask at this point, you know, you've come to, you've got Parks and Rec's blessing, you've been, you've gotten, you know, yourself and your partner and friend commune and you know neighbors and whatnot to manage as many plots as you can personally and try to get more of them out um and we know and i know now obviously as i said at the start of the interview that you're the steering committee chair mm -hmm. um so what roles have you played in between those years um and through and during you know your tenure with brewery town garden so there hasn't been a time I hasn't, haven't been on um, the steering committee in some capacity. Um, early on, I was doing um, the web, um, you know, setting up our uh, 
Google Drive, um, getting our um, mail set up and, and kind of all of those nuts and bolts kinds of things. Um, and started out, I think, as serving as vice chair. Um, we, um, the, the chair, myself and um, treasurer, you know, went in and set up a bank account um, and got that all established and um, also uh, filed the paperwork to become a nonprofit. So those early days were just really kind of scrambling everybody, all hands on deck to get, get things up, up to speed. Um, kind of pulled in resources that we had. So I, I knew a sign maker. So we had the big sign put up on the corner. He actually just covered over the marathon <laughs> sign with vinyl, which worked out perfectly. <laughs> um, and we um, wanted to get a bulletin board so that you know anybody coming up to the gate um, could read about the garden and um, know how to become part of the garden. Um, so we got that installed and, and in place. And so, yeah, it was just a, a lot of, um, and trying to get the word out. We um, we had people reaching out to um, the press and there were, we'll see a couple of early on, um, early morning reports on um, the garden from local news stations. Um, I don't know if those are still available to see, but that all happened early on too. Yeah, those might, I, those might be. I am sorry to say I forgot to include citations for everything on my notes, so I can't remember where I got everything. But, yeah. um, but so basically, um, it, like from the early days on, well, yeah, the early days, you helped set up kind of a lot of the logistical stuff with the Google Drive um, and the bank account and the 501c3 and mm -hmm. a sign maker. It's amazing to me that technically, I guess the marathon sign is still there. It's just covered up. Um, but because the sign in the bulletin board, I also want to say, um, are some of the first, they're like, are some of the first things that I noticed when I uh, visited the garden. Um, which I did, which I've done a few times, just walking. I used to live in North Philly, and it was a walk, mm -hmm. a stop along the way from my place to uh, Fairmount. Okay. But yeah, um, so yeah, you have a very like it's a very well. It's got it's got good signage, and it's hard to miss the signs and the the sign that was in board in the mural, um, the mural especially. Um, yeah. We're very, we inherited um, a really good infrastructure and and so um, the small bit that we had to do to, for kind of our marketing purposes, um, you know, the sign, the bulletin board and getting our online presence set up was pretty simple. You know, we had, we had time to do that because the infrastructure was already there. We weren't building the garden from the ground up. So we were very fortunate for that. And the mural, um, early in those early days, mural arts was still bringing tours. I don't know, well, with COVID, I, I don't know. Um, I assume they suspended those. I don't know. It had been a few years prior to COVID before um, that uh, between our last tour and, and then. So I don't know if they're still doing those bus tours, but um, you know that would always expose a lot of people to the garden too. Yeah, one of the things that jumps out to me from the mural is the I believe those are beats in one corner, mm -hmm. um, and yeah. then you also have a beat, I believe, on your logo for Brewery Town Garden. Yeah. So, so that um, I, you know, um, I don't claim to be a graphic artist by any stretch of the imagination, but um, I designed that logo, and then. Um, we have actually uh, an illustrator in the garden now um, who's done a lot of really incredible work for us, but, and he continues to use the, the beat. So that's in a very different and, and definitely more artistic way, but um, it continues to kind of be our, our symbol, I guess. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a very cool symbol. Um, and very fitting for a garden that already had a lot of the, that had a lot of the groundwork done um as you said um but 
you know, also, uh, also, you know, still uh, needs needs care and all and has really good rewards. I think beets are a very great vegetable. Um, but, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Yes, you can do anything with them. Um, I don't. I don't know. Um, I grew up with a lot of boiling, but you know, also roasting. But anyway, um, enough about beets. Um, I want to, I guess, jump through now a bit to kind of the present of the garden and talk about uh, a typical year um, in Brewery Town. So I know, and I know that you have, again, on your website, you have a lot of fantastic information about, you know, all the all the typical things. Um, that you do um, in terms of traditions, like work days, and you have workshops, as edu educational workshops as well. And you have done a CSA um, and farm stand, bake, you know, bake sale, and you have community composting as well, which is very neat. Um, yeah, um, as a as a community composter, right, it's appreciated. But um, so what? traditions for you characterize garden work? For, for me personally or for um, the community garden at Brewerytown Garden? Uh, yeah, yeah, for you <laughs> for you personally, I guess. Okay, um, so I start to get excited probably like most gardeners and in, in January, um, get the seed catalog or start going online. I actually, um, love getting the catalogs because I can just sit under a blanket and thumb through and mark the pages and and then go online um, to place my order. Um, but getting those seeds, um, I always start my seeds too soon and then I have this jungle um, of plants under grow lights um, when it's still far too cold to, to put them out. <laughs> um, and then there's the whole um, um, transporting them up from the basement where I have shelving and grow lights and um, to the outside and then trying to figure out where in the house they can be safely put without cats getting into them and um, so that's kind of the beginnings and then transporting them in various ways to the to the garden once we have a greenhouse at the garden but I still start my seeds at home. And I keep saying I should do this at the garden in the greenhouse, but there's just something about the, in the winter and being able to go down to the basement and have all of this growth. And um, so I, yeah, I probably won't change my ways. Um, so that's kind of the kickoff. And then we start having, you know, our meetings in February. Um, so then starting to talk to the other gardeners again and, and get excited about what we're looking to grow and um, start meeting with the steering committee and deciding about what programming we might be offering. And um, so we get started with our planning pretty early in the season. And then um, by March, we're, we're out there turning the soil and, and having the first cleanup days. We take part in any of the city offerings. So from the streets department, um, spring cleanup to parks and recs, um, love your park. Um, you know, we participate in, in all of those in addition to things that we organize ourselves. Um, so that's, you know, for me, the exciting time. I um, have less love for the garden in the heat of the summer <laughs> um, and when the mosquitoes are biting and, <laughs> But um, that's also an exciting time when you're harvesting and um, can also be daunting when you, you know, don't know how you're gonna end up processing all of those tomatoes or where you're gonna, um, but there's always places and people who um, are happy to have fresh grown tomatoes or whatever you're growing. So it's a good problem to have. <laughs> Yeah, you've gone from uh, being the person looking at your grandmother's jars of pickles to becoming the person putting in those tomatoes and green beans in the jars. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think about her every year when I do it. My brother yeah. and I talk about it a lot too. Yeah. 
Um, but so then you kind of have the heat of summer harvesting. Um, uh, what what happens? What's what's you've gone through kind of winter and spring and summer now. What what are you doing mm -hmm. fall? So um, it's so funny. We we run our our farm stand through the end of September, and it's it's always kind of a um, a you breathe a sigh of relief when that last Saturday of September has come and gone and you can now put the farm stand to bed and um, as much as we enjoy it and sometimes we you know make more work out of it than it needs to be like we um, borrowed a cider press from um, the tool library at PHS this year and, and did apple cider for all of our customers um, at the farm stand. And it was a lot of fun, but also, you know, just <laughs> another obligation, another another thing to do. But um, so, th so then it just feels like things are coming to an end, but no, um, we usually do some kind of fall celebration in October. And in fact, um, we hosted this year Neighborhood Garden Trust um, celebration and then um, that same week we had a, a movie night for the kids where we um, pop popcorn and um, showed um, the movie Coco um, and had oh gosh probably close to 50 people in the garden for the movie and um, someone from the garden decided let's do a Halloween safe trick-or-treating for the kids so they've got games lined up and um, prizes and candy and all, all sorts of things for a costume party for kids in the neighborhood on um, October 30th. And it doesn't end then, we, we continue the Wednesday before, no, Tuesday, I think, before Thanksgiving, we, no, it is Wednesday, sorry. Um, we have a Thanksgiving market that we started running a few years ago. So we buy um, turkeys through the common market. Um, so we take orders ahead of the time. And um, we ask people um, to consider um, buying turkeys for donation too. We usually line up some families that we can donate to. And then we order um, you know, traditional vegetables um, that we sell at the market the day that, that people are coming to pick up turkeys. So you can come buy vegetables, whether you ordered a turkey or not. And then again, we you know, donate um, to families um, a nice turkey dinner for their Thanksgiving. So that's generally the end of the year, <laughs> which is, um, gives us a couple of months um, where the garden's pretty quiet other than the composting. Got it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was going to ask next about, you know, garden recreation. So I'm glad you got to talk a little bit about um, about a movie night. I know that you do those throughout the uh, months when you're active as well, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, we have such a great space um, for entertainment in the back of the garden that was never really um, set up for gardening. So it's it's concrete. There's a a, we call it the stage. It was actually used um, when Marathon um, built it. Um, they actually served um, summer school lunch program back there for, I think they managed for one year, but I think that was kind of the intended purpose of it. Um, but we um, do concerts there. So we've had um, mostly jazz groups um, and then DJs that will set up and perform there. Um, so we use that stage area quite a bit. Um, at our height, which was right before the pandemic, we had um, a summer concert series and we did three um, jazz concerts um, that summer, which um, was pretty ambitious. And, and um, our goal is always to offer everything at no charge. So we may sell food um, in order to kind of uh, make up the cost of of um, the band or you know whatever we need to pay for for the entertainment, but we um, we make the concerts free so that um, all of the neighbors can come in and enjoy. Um, movie nights have been a regular thing that we we've done. Um, this past summer um, focused a lot on um, 
health and wellness and offering educational programming. So, um, and arts. So every other Sunday, practically there was, well, I guess that's not quite true. At least two, two to three Sundays um, a month, we had programming either for kids or for, for adults um, or families too. Um, so for example, elders could come in and have health screenings done, have their blood pressure taken and um, uh, pulse ox. And we had a nurse, we have a nurse in the garden who was um, doing that. And then uh, we have a nutritionist in the garden. And so she would um, maybe prepare a healthy um, uh, item recipe, one of her favorites and um, serve that and talk about healthy eating and healthy diet. Um, one of my favorite things this summer, we did a, a children's yoga class and that was great to see how much the kids really got into yoga. Yeah, that, that sounds, that sounds really cool. I think I would have appreciated yoga a bit more if I should learn it from a young age. Um, but, um, and yeah, it's a great overview of the work of workshops that you've done um and um thank you for sharing that information um i want to ask though because you brought it up um that the height of the concerts was prior to the pandemic um so how has the garden changed since the pandemic started in 2020 um so the in 2020 um i mean we yeah we made major changes and then we've actually kind of circled back to, to some of um, what we had been doing. We were offering a CSA in, in the spring where um, we would, um, we were growing a few things, but we were ordering through common market and, and subscribers would come and they would, um, we would have everything laid out and they would pick up, you know, the items that they, um, they could pick out their own, um, bunch of kale and, and, you know, squash and anything that they, that we were offering in the CSA that week. Um, once the pandemic hit, we realized, you know, and it was early on, we didn't know all of the ways that it was being, um, people were being infected. And so, um, we moved to the pre-made boxes. And so we started offering our CSA that way. Um, and, so people could just come in and grab a box and go. Um, that year we didn't do our farm stand, um, but we were still growing food and giving it to neighbors down on the corner where we would operate our farm stand. We um, became part of the Farmers to Families program um, with Common Market. So we were giving 400 food boxes away every Saturday. Um, and we had received a grant from Arnold Bread um, for a couple of projects. And um, we talked um, and they were fine with us kind of pivoting from the projects that we had proposed. Um, this was a $5,000 grant. Um, and they allowed us to use some of that money to um, buy food so we we would supplement the vegetable boxes with proteins so we would buy eggs or um, peanut butter or other other groceries that um, we could help feed some families with and um, we also uh, convinced Arnold Bread to donate bread <laughs> so they would come every Saturday with a delivery of 400 loaves of bread that we would hand out with with the boxes um, so that was really invigorating and, and feeling like um, we were really doing something to support the neighbors and the neighborhood um, through the early days of the pandemic. Um, so that that was great. We didn't do any, we didn't, we did clean up days. Everyone um, stayed very far apart. It was, it was very, we, you know, we're all masked and uh, much like, you know, PHS changed um, with City Harvest, where um, instead of going and picking up it from the greenhouse, we were waiting at the garden for Adam or Sally to deliver our vegetables to us. And, um, you yeah, know, just um, felt very different and a little bit 
but sad, but always just really um, so, you know, um, excited to see them when they would come and, and to have that connection again, to know that we weren't just there alone, that you know, they were still there supporting us. And so that was really important too. Um, so since then we, we've started to, oh, the other, the other thing uh, with programming, um, we had applied for um, a grant with No Kid Hungry and Cooking Matters, and which I think is a federal grant and we received that. And so we were able to do online cooking classes. So we had um, a group of gardeners um, who were um, most involved in organizing and um, teaching. We um, have a gardener who, uh, well, the nutritionist was involved, of course. And then um, we also have a gardener who had spent quite a few years in catering. Um, so they were our primary cooks and we have a videographer in the garden who actually does some work for the Food Network. <laughs> so um, he um, did the videography. So he would go into their homes, um, again, masked and, and set up and, and record them and we had 50 families, I think, that were taking part um, really uh, mostly in North Philly, but around the city. Um, and through the grant, all of them would get, um, they got basic cooking supplies. So measuring cups and um, some pots and pans and measuring spoons, I guess, too, and, and things like that. And if they needed any knives, cutting boards, if they had needed anything special, then that would come with groceries. So they would get groceries for the recipe that was being demonstrated. And the whole idea was um, to make um, nutritious snacks or meals um, that were easy to make and fast and that um, kids would enjoy helping in the kitchen. Um, so that was really the focus of that. And that really inspired then um, the programming that we did this summer with the health and wellness programming. Um, we retained a lot of those families who are coming back um, and but this time coming into the garden rather than uh, tuning in from home over Zoom. So that that definitely um, you know was uh, something really great I think that came out of of that time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and you've kind of talked you've kind of talked about it with just you know um, going through the changes from pre pandemic to during the pandemic to um, bringing families into the garden for the health wellness programming. Um, but how would you say the garden has changed um, overall since you first uh, you know started it? Um, Um, I, one thing that I noticed during the pandemic and, and that has continued is more of, I think, I don't know, buy-in is the right phrase to use, but um, pre-pandemic, it seemed like we had gardeners who were just kind of wanting to come in, do their thing and go. Um, I think the um, real desire for community and need for community and, and some of the work that we were doing in the community um, really um, changed the focus for a lot of people. So um, whereas early on, there might've been a smaller group of us who were offering the programming and that uh, during the pandemic and, and this continued on, um, we have more people who are participating in kind of the common good programming that we do um, than before the pandemic. And so I think um, that's one big change that, that I've noticed. Um, we really encourage everyone to, to, to become involved and we you know, ask it of them in um, work hours that um, are required. They pay a pretty nominal uh, fee to garden and then, but you need to also give some sweat equity to the garden and you can choose how you do that. You, um, you know, we all have different schedules and different strengths and, uh, but people have really, I think, post pandemic stepped up more to share 
um, their own interests and, and ways that they can really contribute uh, to the garden and to the neighborhood. Yeah, and I would be, well, I think it's also important, at least for me as, as a historian to mention that you also re just recently, like in the last few years, um, had your big preservation effort and are now preserved for NGT as of this year, right? Right. Neighbor the neighbor NGT be the Neighborhood Gardens Trust. Yes. Um, yeah, that was something we didn't talk about from early on, but um, with Parks and Rec, that secured the city owned portion of the garden, but we also had private lots that um, were always at risk for being sold and for the, a couple of years had been on the market. So we were um, nervously watching and, um, and uh, we would see people come with you know a sheet of paper in their hand trying to figure out which lot it was that they were looking to potentially buy and basically almost shaming them and <laughs> you don't want to buy here this is a community garden you'll take you know, if you build a house here you'll block all our sun <laughs> you won't be able to grow vegetables and um so we weren't rude but we also um weren't all that welcoming to people looking to buy our land <laughs> um and then of course um contacted uh jenny and marlena and Shamar and um, yeah, we're able to work with Neighborhood Garden Trust to to secure those lots, and um, you know have to also um, credit the owners who were willing to wait. I you know the lots weren't selling. I don't think um, you know I, I think this was their best option anyway. But um, you know they um, agreed not to to sell while we were trying to secure the money from the state uh, to purchase the lots. And, and so that, that helped us out too. So yeah, it's all secure now. Yay. Um, so speaking of, <laughs> speaking of positive things, um, I guess, uh, do you have any favorite stories you wanna share about Brewery Town Garden and your experiences in it? Oh. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, as much as I love gardening, I feel like that's the least amount of time I spend there. It's really, um, it's just such an active space for um, gathering with neighbors, even if it's an impromptu. You know, we, we also have um, the rec center across the street. And so, um, Gardeners will make a date to go over for adult swim at the rec center and then, you know, go back to the garden and have a little nosh and maybe a glass of wine after a swim or something. And so just the, the way it becomes a, a really nice gathering spot for, um, for neighbors to just sit and relax. Um, we didn't talk about the, I mentioned the Arnold bread grant um, that money was to um, establish a sensory garden um, back kind of behind our compost area where we early on didn't even realize we had more land and it's a little pocket garden back there that's just absolutely beautiful and the minute you walk through the archway into the garden you, the, the sounds of the city are just kind of silenced and it's kind of amazing um, so it's a it's a great place, and it's just it's nice to know that you know people are going back there and just kind of letting um, the stresses of the day wash away um, while they sit and relax in a beautiful um, setting. So um, that's a favorite moment, of course. Um, a funny story. <laughs> um, I had a call from at work. This was way early on before the Parks and Rec days. Well, might have been right after, um, where the garden had been cordoned off by the police. Um, one of the gardeners thought he found a human bone in our compost pile, <laughs> and so I rushed to the garden, and they had. Um, someone come out and he took the bone to the he was taking it to be analyzed and everything and it turned out to be a goat bone and I don't know you know we have 
raccoons and you know every all sorts of animals tra <laughs> tramping through there but so I have no idea how it got in there but the the funny thing to me was the the person who found it and who thought it was a human bone is a doctor <laughs> um, he no longer gardens with us but anyway um, it was there's was just so much um, drama around the whole incident and um, yeah anyway I still kind of laugh about it when I think about it. I mean, between the nutritionist, the uh, the videographer, <laughs> the former caterer, the building of a special, we haven't mentioned that you also, you're a conservator, right? Um, I am. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you, like, but the number of advanced degrees and, or, or, <laughs> or not just advanced degrees, but also just specialized skills, someone was going to come out of that looking. <laughs> <laughs> a little silly but yeah. um mm. you know um but that but you know on the other but as you mentioned also um you know your variety of different skill sets in the garden has led to a lot of different programming like the health and wellness stuff which um which is obviously exciting and that does lead me into my next um question which is what i know i know it's not yet you know time for planning next year's events um as, as you mentioned, but what are your, what are some things that you're considering what, um, for, you know, the future next year, et cetera, what are your future plans and or, and, or and aspirations um, for Brewery Town? Um, I mean, we'll, you know, obviously continue with um, the, the most um, popular things, which are um, our farm stand and um, um, kind of all of the the things that um, come with that. We um, have hosted other vendors um, this year and kind of expand on that probably a little bit too. Um, with the movie night, there was a lot of interest expressed in doing more of those. So we'll probably um, try to make that more of a regular occurrence um, in the coming year and maybe years. Um, yeah, it would be great to, We've we've had um, I think we just had live music once this year in the garden, so it'd be great to to bring more live music back in. Um, but yeah, the health and wellness program will probably continue with that. Um, yeah, it's just a very active active space. Um, we also um, set up a um, little free library just outside. Um, the garden too and it's i i wasn't sure at first but it's kind of amazing to me to see um you know it'll fill up and then suddenly be empty and um you know, so those books are coming and going from that space and that's great to see too um yeah i think focusing as much as we can on on families and and um getting kids interested in gardening um should probably be a, one of our focuses for the coming year yeah you're going going to continue your ethic of kind of sharing um of sharing the produce and sharing the community experiences it sounds like because I, I mean as you mentioned um gardening is the least amount of of time you spend in the garden um and there's a and so uh i think that that's a you know a good note to end it on of the continuing legacy of community building in the brewery town garden space. Um, so I want to thank you um, for talking to me um, today, Sharon. It was an honor to learn about the garden from you. Um, thank you. Yeah, and I'm going to turn off the recorder now.